It is said that no one can love you like a mother can. That blood is thicker than water and family is more important than anything else. What happens though when a mother is pushed to breaking point? What could possibly drive her to do the unthinkable? And what happens after? In 2007, in the notorious suburb of Lavender Hill in Cape Town, one woman would take the life of the child she brought into the world. And the news would leave some divided and many more questioning the deeper and some sometimes ignored factors at play. This is the heart-wrenching case of Ellen Pakis. Hello and welcome to Murder and Mayhem, South African True Crime, with me, your host, Bala Monsoon. First of all, we've reached and surpassed 27,000 subscribers. I'm sorry, what? So thank you to each and every single one of you. I appreciate you and your support more than you can ever know. If you missed my last episode, the highly controversial case of the Dickerson family murders, I've linked it in a card above. And by now, some of you would have noticed the new hair colour as well. I needed a change, new season, new me. If you're interested in these hair colour products and you are within South Africa where I am currently shipping, I am looking into international shipping, I just need to work out the relevant costs. You can find all of the hair care products as well as my self-defence and safety range online my website, balamonsoon.com. On that note, just before I start the episode, I just want to go through some housekeeping since it's been a while that I've said this and it seems that it needs to be reiterated. Number one, please be respectful in the comments section of any content you see online, whether it's my channel, whether it's someone else's. I welcome diverse opinions, but as soon as you become bigoted, discriminatory, and just downright rude, you're going to be booted. No, seriously, you would not even imagine the type of comments I've dealt with in the last three weeks. And the second thing, which I feel should be common knowledge, but I will state it anyway, these episodes are purely for edutainment. They are not psychiatric consultations. This means I'm giving you my take on the perpetrators and the crimes they have committed from my experience, my knowledge base, my expertise, and my point of view. I am not making a diagnosis nor giving testimony in a court case. And on that note, I thought you might be interested to know the color of my hair or the makeup that I wear has no impact in the level of expertise and knowledge that I have. I mean, I would really assume that that is common sense, but it appears that common sense just ain't so common anymore. No, really, I wasn't aware that bleaching my hair and applying makeup damaged my brain cells in some way or form. But okay, I've given that enough attention, so rant over. For those of you new to my channel, I swear I do not begin every single episode like this, so let me introduce myself. If you're returning, just know that I am so thankful for your support, and you can skip ahead to the narrative by using the timestamp on screen. So here it is in a nutshell. I'm a mental health professional who just so happens to be obsessed with makeup, true crime, and uncovering the motives that drive people to do what they do. My intimate knowledge and experience within the field led me to create the first trauma-informed South African true crime series. Every week, I post a brand new video looking at a real-life crime from a psychological viewpoint. During these episodes, I also try to share psychological knowledge and concepts that you may or may not be aware of in an easy to understand format. So if all of that sounds like something that is right up your alley, then please do consider subscribing and joining the Balaboo family. But if you're more a fan of podcasts, no worries, your girl got you covered. You can find me for my sister podcast, Murder and Mayhem South African True Crime, available on all major streaming channels. Just a quick disclaimer for today's episode. Today's narrative contains material citing murder as well as substance abuse. As always, I mean absolutely no disrespect to the victim nor their family. The purpose of this video is to shed further light on the crime that was committed while spreading awareness about the psychological nature of the narrative. This episode has been thoroughly researched by myself and includes, where available, real-life accounts, footage and images of and from individuals involved directly in the case. So, 
let's get into it. In order to fully understand the story I'm about to tell you, you need to understand more about where it occurred. Because context, in this case especially, is everything. The majority of this narrative takes place in Lavender Hill, an area of the Cape Flats within Cape Town, about 24 kilometers from the city center. It is home to around 100,000 people and covers an area of 1.63 square kilometers. Lavender Hill was developed as an area for colored individuals in the 1960s and 1970s as a result of the Group Areas Act under the apartheid era of 1950. For those unfamiliar with South African history and culture, the term coloured refers to people belonging to a legally acknowledged population grouping with a diverse and mixed heritage. It is not viewed in the same way as it is in America. I mean, just ask some of the South Africans on TikTok from about two weeks ago. The racial segregation policies of apartheid divided South Africa into sections where only specific race groups were allowed to work and live. This basically meant that all individuals who were not part of the white race grouping were moved out of more desirable areas, like the Atlantic seaboard, for example. And they were moved into council housing, which more often than not consisted of two or three story apartment blocks or compact houses. Along with basic and in many cases insufficient housing, the service, delivery and resources supplied to these non-white areas, this meant that those living in these locations grew up surrounded by a poor social economic environment. The forced removal and relocation of these non-white individuals resulted in multiple psychosocial ramifications. People were upset at having to leave their homes and be shoved to the outskirts of the city purely because of the color of their skin. Within many of the non-white neighborhoods, gangsterism, substance abuse, violence, and the crime rates began to increase. Even in the face of important alterations of apartheid policies after democratization in 1994. And in the years to follow, and to this day, many continue to grow up in areas which are now classified as high risk, due to the legacies of the past. Those living in these spaces face various adversities and due to the surroundings are often subject to higher probability of either being victims or perpetrators of crimes, experiencing high levels of stress and trauma, and even developing substance use disorders, amongst other things. That is not to say that these issues do not occur elsewhere in other suburbs and within other race groups, but all I'm saying is that there is an increased risk in the spaces I have mentioned. Along with the omnipresent culture of violence that is embedded into these areas, within the Western Cape in particular, there is a high prevalence of methamphetamine use. And it's very rarely only the user whose life is impacted. Within the families and caregivers of these users, there is a constant feeling of fear and panic. And these feelings are common worldwide. If you've ever had a friend, family member or loved one stuck in a cycle of substance abuse, and you've been there to experience the knock-on effects, then you will know exactly what I'm speaking about. Regardless of the substance being abused, there are often feelings of guilt, anxiety, sadness, anger, and shame attached to life with such an individual. Although substance abuse does not discriminate in terms of age, it is more often the younger individuals who find themselves to be the most vulnerable population. And that is exactly the case within the Western Cape in particular. The allure begins in school-aged children, leading to higher dropout rates, and this is just the reality for so many. This is just an ordinary day within these high-risk areas. So now that you have a slight understanding about the space and the context of the environment, it's time to meet Ellen. Ellen was born in Cape Town on the 6th of December 1961. Upon her birth, it wasn't even her mother who gave her her name. It was a nurse at the hospital. And this would kind of be a foreshadowing for the years that would follow. Prior to her conception, her mother and father had been together but not married. Upon her birth, however, her biological father had abandoned both her mother and herself. The pair had then taken shelter with her grandmother, her mother's mother, for the first three months of her life. But unfortunately, due to multiple factors at play, they were left with no other options but to live on the streets. 
As the years went on, Ellen's mother found a job as a live-in domestic worker and subsequently met and married a man named Lucas. Whilst she was employed, Ellen's mother was able to have her family live with her in the backyard accommodation of her employer. But it was in this environment that Ellen would experience a tumultuous upbringing, subjected to violence, neglect and trauma. As she grew up in a home surrounded by caregivers who abused alcohol, she was emotionally and physically neglected, her existence unimportant to those around her, especially her mother. And unfortunately, things just kept getting worse for the little girl. At the age of four, she was first sexually abused, and this would become a recurrent pattern until the age of 29 years old. It had initially started with the men that her mother would date on and off. Later on, it would be the two sons of the woman that her mother had worked for. She was only 10 years old at the time and during the ordeal her mother and stepfather were present. She was only 10 years old at the time and during the ordeal her stepfather and mother were present but intoxicated and thus did nothing to stop what happened to her. Several of her later perpetrators were also acquaintances of her caregivers as well as men from the neighborhood. The impact of this repeated trauma at such an early age led to her continuously wetting the bed every night until she turned 16. And so the years passed until her baby brother Joseph entered the world. This would be the first child of her mother and stepfather. Soon after Joseph was born, Ellen's mother was given a house in Lavender Hill as part of a council housing project. And it was in this home that Ellen, although never the recipient of nurturing and love as a child, would become a caregiver to her sibling. And in school, things were not much better than home life, with her struggling with schoolwork as well as forming relationships and bonds with her peers and teachers. She completed up until grade four and then for a multitude of reasons she left to go and get a job. She began working at the Nanucci Brothers Laundry. Here being underaged and vulnerable she would also be sexually abused. The narrative of abuse was a reoccurring pattern within her life. It eventually became too much for Ellen to process and having to face everything alone with absolutely no support, she ran away from home. In the months that followed, she began using cannabis to numb her pain and soon after, to survive, she turned to prostitution. And this was her life as a young teenager, hustling to get by, to survive. After a while, she met a man and the two began to date. Before long though, she would fall pregnant, but she would not carry the baby to term as this man would assault her so severely that she would suffer a miscarriage. Two years later, at the age of 16, yes, she was still so young, she moved back home and she fell pregnant again. Shortly after the birth of her son, Rudolf, she married the infant's father, Mervyn Farrow. The marriage lasted only six months though, before the two went their separate ways. Despite all the hurdles that she faced, Ellen's disposition always remained positive, with her often being described as honest, helpful, caring, loving, and kind-hearted. She had hope that her future would always be better than her past. Life didn't get much easier for Ellen though, and she would once again be married, this time to Yuri Karalis Titus. During this period of her marriage, she would conceive and have two sons, Colin and Adam. Adam was her last born and he was conceived as a result of Ellen being raped. He entered this world on the 27th of August 1987. Home life with Yuri was no walk in the park though, with him constantly displaying anger and aggression towards Ellen and her children, often induced by his excessive substance abuse, not uncommon of many in the area though. And before long, he left, leaving Ellen to raise all three boys on her own. She was only 27 years old at the time. And just when things seemed as though they would never improve, she met O'Neill Puckies. And the following year in 1988, the two were married. In the years to follow, he would raise and care for Ellen's boys as though they were his own. Adam was only a baby when O'Neill entered his life. And as he grew into a child, he would be known as being gentle, pleasant, helpful and altogether happy. 
He was a sporty young boy, fond of music and dancing. He also loved rapping and had a dream to create his own music one day. He was particularly close to Ellen and the two of them shared a deep bond, with her often spoiling him as he was the baby of the family. But as the years went on and Adam, or AB as he was known by many, began to hang around a different crowd, experimenting with different substances. His behavior changed and every day he was less and less of the boy that Ellen had given birth to. So what prompted this behavioral change, you may ask? Well, as you would know, it's never really one thing, but rather an interaction of various factors, with perhaps a slightly bigger focus on one in particular. Around the time that AB began to change, he found out how he was conceived, through the assault of his mother. Although only in primary school, AB began skipping classes, much to the dismay of both Ellen and O'Neill. They encouraged him to go back to school, which he did for a while. AB was in Levana Primary School for a period of time, but after not attending for 40 consecutive days in a row, they deregistered him. He was only in grade 7 at the time. Ellen didn't realize that he was not in school until it was too late, as during the day O'Neill was out of the house and she was at work at a local children's home. Ellen had however managed to get him registered in another school, which in itself is a feat, and the principal even had a uniform set aside for him. But on the first day of school, A.B. absconded. During the daytime, 14-year-old A.B. would be out, smoking cannabis on the streets of Lavender Hill, left to his own devices. Ellen started having to creep out quietly of her own home because A.B. would follow her, force her to go to the ATM and draw out money. Another drastic wake-up call was when A.B. had stolen O'Neill's nest egg, money that he had been saving from his work as a car guard for months. And when Ellen was home, she would notice that money and items from the home kept disappearing. And A.B. often smelt of the substances that he had been smoking. For him, the use of cannabis would be termed a gateway drug, which led him down the path eventually of methamphetamine use. For those unaware, methamphetamine is a lethal man-made stimulant drug with a very high prevalence of use, particularly within the Western Cape. It goes by many names, crystal, speed, meth, and most popularly, tuck. It is known as tuck due to the ticking sound that it makes when smoked. Prior to 2003, it was virtually unknown and unheard of. However, in the current day, it is one of the most abused drugs, which is in a large way impacted by its price, access, and ease of production. It is mostly comprised of ingredients like amphetamines, talcum powder, baking powder, starch, glucose, and large amounts of cold and flu medication. Oh, but let me not forget also things like antifreeze, battery acid, acetone, and drain cleaner. Right, so that's basically what AB was now consuming on the regular. The impact of this use is not only evident within the behavioral and physical spheres, but also psychological. AB began to show more anger and aggression, particularly towards Ellen, a person he had once loved and respected. He would experience multiple angry outbursts, terrorizing Ellen in order to obtain money from her to feed his addiction. And it wasn't long until the law became involved. A.B. first encountered the police when he was only 14 years old, when police officers were called after he broke the window of Ellen's bedroom. On another occasion, they were called when, as a young adult in 2007, Ellen arrived home from work to be threatened by A.B. holding a pair of scissors. But these two incidents were just the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. Ellen had always felt a deep connection to her youngest son, and so she did everything she could to try and help him. He was her son, after all. She couldn't bear to kick him out onto the streets, but she also couldn't face living with his outbursts and the fear of violence in her home. And so she built a shed outside, in their backyard, so he could still have a place to stay. She would also install a security gate on their bedroom door, a front gate outside their home, and burglar bars onto all the windows of the house. This was in pure desperation to keep herself and O'Neill safe, but at the same time to look after her son. Everything she did was to try and keep him safe. She would also even hide food for A.B., even when O'Neill had told her to stop. 
She struggled. She couldn't turn off her maternal love for him no matter what he did. And this is the experience of so many parents, especially mothers, who face the same struggles. But AB knew no bounds. He would steal whatever and exploit whomever he could in order to feed his ever-growing addiction. He would steal it all, from groceries, dishes, cell phones and household items, to O'Neill's savings, their vehicle, wind window panes, tools, copper pipes, and even electricity cables. And as the list of stolen items grew, so did the severity of Abe's behavior. He was out of control, experiencing frequent hallucinations, delusions, psychotic behavior, insomnia, and of course, violence. All common within long-term methamphetamine users. For A.B., his substance use was the most important thing in the world to him. The price of ensuring that her son was not homeless, though, was high, as Ellen constantly lived in fear, barely sleeping through the nights. She became a shell of the woman that she once was. She isolated herself from others and experienced a deep-seated fear and panic almost all of the time. A.B., on the other hand, did not take notice of any of this, as he was far too consumed with his own addiction, living for his next high at whatever the cost. He didn't care for the sanctity of his mother and O'Neill's home. He would throw water through the windows of the main house and he once even set the kitchen curtains alight whilst Ellen was still in the home. Once he stole all of her clothing and she only had the items on her back, until a good Samaritan had helped her out. Then there were times when he damaged the home and the burglar bars with an axe in an attempt to steal things to sell from inside the home. On another occasion, whilst the pair were at work, he gained access to the house, destroying the walls and causing physical damage to the structure of the home. Ellen would also fear that one day A.B. would rape her. This was a level of unsafe she felt around him. And this was Ellen's life every single day for years. She would wake up praying to God and each night on her way home she would continue that prayer, hoping only for peace and tranquility. She didn't just pray though, she tried many avenues for help. From the police on multiple occasions, to rehabilitation centers, social workers, and even the court. On one occasion, she managed to get A.B. admitted to hospital, where doctors gave him an antidepressant injection for the withdrawal symptoms. But then A.B. missed his appointment with the psychiatrist the following day. This resulted in him beginning to use once again. Ellen even tried to move to get away from A.B., but she did not just have the money to up and go, and council house came with a very long wait list. Every single attempt failed, and her hope for normality was just that, a hope. And as A.B. became less of the son that she had once known, Ellen became less of the woman that she had once been. And this was how the days went on, until she had reached breaking point, seven years later. On the 12th of September 2007, a morning that started like any other, Ellen did what she would never have imagined doing. She did the unthinkable. That morning, she had made tea for her son and brought it to the outside room. A.B. was lying on the ground in a daze. She told him to get onto the bed, which he did, and promptly fell back into that sleep-induced haze. As A.B. laid in the bed, in the space that Ellen had erected for him, she wrapped a rope around the one bedpost. The other end of the rope was then tied into a noose of sorts and placed around A.B.'s neck. She moved quietly with purpose. A.B. then awoke, pulling at the rope around his neck, shock in his eyes. He then reached for a nearby plank to defend himself. She asked him when was he going to listen. He responded by calling her mammy and telling her that he was going to listen now. And as the rope cut through Ellen's hands, she pulled it tighter, steadfast in her decision. A.B. tried to fight back, but ultimately, a few moments later, he took his final breath. He was 20 years old at the time. And then Ellen sat there in the silence of the morning. Coming back into the moment, she closed her eyes and immediately asked God for forgiveness. She glanced over at A.B., who was lying on the bed, peacefully, as though he was asleep. A few minutes later, she went inside and got dressed for the day. 
she contacted her employer at the home for the elderly that she worked at, Mr. Rogers, to tell him what she had done and then with him proceeded straight to the police station to turn herself in and confess. And soon the news of the crime that she had committed would make headlines, first nationwide and then worldwide bringing to light an uncomfortable topic of conversation that many had been ignoring for too long. Upon her confession at the police station, she was arrested and imprisoned for two weeks while awaiting bail, which she was eventually granted for 1,000 rand. The bail money was actually raised by her community, who had no objections with her awaiting her trial from home. And so the months went on. Baby's funeral was held, which Ellen would not only attend, but also end up giving tribute at, after an individual responsible for that task did not show up. The priest who conducted the funeral service would later describe Ellen as soft and compassionate. In October of 2008, her trial began at the Weinberg Regional Court in the Western Cape. Ellen's advocate, Adrian Samuels, had taken her case on a pro bono basis. Ellen pleaded guilty to the charge of the murder of A.B. Pakis. Clinical psychologist Martin Yodaikin would take to the stand and explain how Ellen had experienced a state of emotional dissociation during the murder. He also explained that to Ellen, her son had taken on the image of her past persecutors. He would state that she had reached a limit situation. Often during such times, individuals will find themselves in situations of homicide or suicide. He would also say, and I quote, With all due respect, Ellen Puckies is not a villain. She has been punished all of her life. He would also state that society was mature enough to understand the context of Ellen's lifetime of abuse, the degree to which A.B. had looted their home, and the level of desperation which made this case unique. The defense would conclude that she had acted in self-preservation from a space of desperation and hopelessness, and that a jail sentence would serve no purpose for Ellen nor her family. On the 17th of October 2008, Ellen Puckies was found guilty of murder. After hearing the verdict, Ellen had said, and I quote, I just want to know what's going to happen now. I have been getting a lot of support from family, friends, and the community, but whatever will happen is God's will. The state called for a life sentence with a minimum of 25 years as they believed that the murder was premeditated. The defense, however, called for a non-custodial sentence, which meant any option that did not involve imprisonment. Whilst awaiting her sentence, Ellen had once again asked her community for forgiveness and had said, and I quote, I never thought I could kill someone because I've never hurt anyone not even with words. And finally, after almost 15 months of court appearances and waiting, 48-year-old Ellen Puckies was sentenced on December 11th. She received three years imprisonment, which was fully suspended. This meant she would spend no time in jail. In addition, she was also given 280 hours of community service, roughly 16 hours a month, whilst under the three years of correctional supervision. After hearing her sentence, her other son, Colin, who was 25 years old at the time, had said that he was relieved that the drama of the past year was over and that his mother, Ellen, could now live in peace. I'll fill you in on what Ellen's been up to in a short while, but for now, let's dig a little deeper. This case clearly demonstrates what I'm always explaining in my episodes. The actions and behaviors of human beings are ultimately the result of the intersection of various psychosocial factors. In this case, the dominant one was substance abuse. So, let's take that deeper. Crystal meth is one of the street names for a drug known as methamphetamine. It is a man-made central nervous system stimulant, a type of drug that lets people stay awake and do continuous activity with less need for sleep. Thus, those who use and those who ultimately go on to abuse the substance believe that the drug will allow their bodies to continuously keep going. However, it is incredibly damaging to both the body and brain, especially over extended periods of use. There are also immediate health problems that can be life-threatening, such as rapid or irregular heartbeat, heart attacks, elevated blood pressure, decreased appetite, 
teeth grinding, hypothermia, seizures, or even strokes. Of all recreational drugs, meth pushes the dopamine levels of how one feels to the highest highs and the lowest lows. This makes it one of the most addictive drugs. Besides the short-term side effects, which I just mentioned, there are some serious long-term effects. Repeated use can lead to loss of motor control, slowed reflexes, and poor decision making. It can also lead the user to feel anxious, confused, unable to sleep, experience mood disturbances, and even psychotic episodes with paranoia, visual or auditory hallucinations, and delusions. But I'm not done just yet. Kidney damage, lung disease, memory loss, and cardiovascular damage are also not uncommon. Appearance-wise, acne and sores, weight loss, and what is termed meth mouth is also a thing. Essentially, severe tooth decay and gum disease, which often causes teeth to break or fall out. The effect on the brain, however, is something else altogether. Meth is known to change brain structure. Long-term use has the propensity to cause significant brain impairment, which often leads to problems with memory and body movements. The impact to the brain can also lead to mood swings and violent behavior. Research has found that the use of the substance alters brain structure, particularly those involved in decision-making. This impairs the ability to suppress habitual behaviors that have become counterproductive. These two effects are correlated, which suggests that the structural change underlies the decline in mental flexibility. This therefore aids to explain why this particular substance addiction is so difficult to treat and why there is significant chance of relapse early in treatment. So to better understand AB, let's look at how his brain would have changed over the months and years. If neuropsychology isn't your thing, feel free to skip ahead. Within a healthy brain, gray and white matter is constantly being produced. The connections within neurons are active and everything is often smooth sailing. Now, when you introduce meth into this equation, here's what's going to happen. First, there will be a decrease in production of glial cells. These are an important part of the central nervous system, responsible for fighting infections and signaling capacities, amongst other things. As AB would use more of the substance, these cells would be killed, particularly those within the prefrontal cortex. You know the part of the brain that assists with not only making plans, paying attention, thinking abstractly, but most importantly, making judgment calls? Yeah, that one. So, to say the least, his cognitive abilities would be affected. A big responsibility for the glial cells is to produce myelin cells, which are vital for signaling between neurons. That means that white matter in the brain starts to decrease with increased use, which leads to functional deficits, such as issues with memory, balance, and mobility. And so AB would become less cognitively capable to think logically, make decisions, He'd be quicker to forget things, and then of course prone to mood swings. And this is due to the decreased dopamine and serotonin within the brain. Consistent use of meth results in the brain having to use stored dopamine. Chronic use depletes these stores, which leaves the user prone to extreme mood effects. Initially extreme euphoria, followed by periods of depression, apathy, and hopelessness. And what I've mentioned are just the more notable effects of the substance on the central nervous system. Another consequence of consistent use is an increase in the production of glutamate calcium, which is associated with neurotoxic effects that can ultimately damage the dendrites on neurons. In simple terms, it ain't good. Damaged dendrites mean a lack of communication between neurons, which means cognitive and motor function difficulties. And so this leaves the user, in this case AB, a completely different person, not only on the surface, but in a neurological sense too. Because of these structural changes, relapse is incredibly common, as the brain can often be triggered into desiring the drug. But just because something is difficult, doesn't mean it's impossible. Some structural changes and functionality within the brain can almost be completely reversed after two years of abstinence. This is also dependent though on the level and period of use. 
Mentally, there is a lot of work that needs to be done, and there can still be significant residual effects that are felt even with an abstinence. Recovery is possible, but it's a lengthy process that requires the right resources and, most importantly, the desire to want to change. All of which, unfortunately, were not present for AB. And there was little to no tangible support for Ellen either. The mental, emotional, physical and financial toll of life with an individual who is an addict is difficult, to say the least. Research indicates that loved ones of such individuals experience high levels of stress, trauma, anxiety, depression and hopelessness. Because with all the attention focused on the individual who's suffering with addiction, the needs of the loved ones who are supporting them are often overlooked. And then due to embarrassment or shame which is linked to the behaviour of the individual who's experiencing the addiction, their loved ones, their support system might find themselves isolating from friends, activities, or even family members. And this further removes the support system. Imagine your life as a ship. The different cabins or areas within the ship represent your hobbies, your support system, therapy, and the things that you can rely on. If one cabin or area of the ship springs a leak and begins to fill with water, it's not the end of the world, as there are other areas of the cabin that are fully functional. So in this case, say for example, your child becomes addicted to crystal meth. If you have the support of friends, family, a rehabilitation center, therapy, and the resources to keep you going, chances are you can handle it. But now imagine you face the same situation, but instead of a leak in one cabin, there's a leak in multiple. Chances are in that case, the boat is going to sink. Without the support of friends and family, external resources and assistance and financial security, dealing with your child's addiction is not as achievable as it may have been. Especially for Ellen, who grew up with complex trauma in the midst of neglect and abuse. As a child, she never had the opportunity to develop a secure attachment with her caregivers. Her relationship with her primary caregiver, her mother, could be described as dysfunctional. And this early attachment style plays a pivotal role in the social and emotional development of the child as they start to understand the world around them. For Ellen, her mother abused her for no good reason and ignored her emotional needs. She was also exposed to violence and sexual abuse as a young child. She was not able to count on her primary caregiver to look after her. This all seems to point towards a potential disorganized attachment style pattern. According to attachment theory, children seek their caregiver during times of distress and fear. In Ellen's case though, she could not rely on her mother. This would ultimately lead to her developing a fear of abandonment, apprehension, low self-esteem and an inability to communicate her needs and emotions. These patterns developed in childhood are often carried into adulthood and form part of a working model of how one understands the world. Ellen was also abandoned as an infant by her father and the subsequent men she would encounter in her early life only served to increase her vulnerability. The sheer trauma of her childhood and adolescent sexual abuse had tangible effects on her functioning. More often than not, after such horrendous encounters, post-traumatic stress disorder can occur. There is the high probability that with no comfort or support to turn to after all these encounters and the likelihood of PTSD being present, in her early life Ellen turned to substance use in the form of cannabis to cope. And during her childhood and adolescence, instead of receiving the help that she so desperately needed, she was left to her own devices, again. This increased her vulnerability, especially at the age she was, living in the area that she was. It is not far-fetched to believe that Ellen was stuck in a cycle of violence, but instead of being a perpetrator, she remained the antithesis. This cycle was further highlighted over the years as she dealt with Abby's addiction and continuous abuse. In addition to the stresses of normal daily life, Abby's addiction resulted in more financial stresses, relationship stresses, and ultimately hindered her social support structures as she began to isolate as a coping mechanism. By the time 2007 came, it can be seen and understood that Ellen was a mere shadow of the woman that she used to be. 
pretending on the surface but struggling within. However, despite everything that she endured over those years, she displayed resilience and strength. She leaned into her religion and her belief in God to pull her through on her darkest days. She traveled a difficult road, but she kept on going, one step at a time. So, what exactly happened to her? Ellen would go on to become a social activist, working with the church to not only fight drug addiction in communities, but intervene with substance users and support rehabilitated drug addicts. She's also a motivational speaker, has told her story in the form of a published book, and even participated in what is known as the Paint Project. In this project, which created work opportunities and skill development for the youth in the community, community members' homes were painted to bring beauty back to the Lavender Hill neighborhood. Two years after the murder, she would admit that although things had seemed to go back to normal, she missed her son. She continuously kept herself busy as she feared thinking too much about her son would cause her to slip into a depression. She then threw herself into her work and she opened a non-profit organization in 2010, the Ellen Pakis Foundation. The goals of the foundation were to empower mothers of addicts, teach them skills, provide information on how to get help for their drug-addicted children, and even teach people how to read. But the dissociation and the distraction finally stopped working, and in 2011, she checked herself into a mental health facility, Falkenberg Hospital. After receiving therapy and having the chance to process things that she hadn't for years, four weeks later, she left feeling lighter and more optimistic. She would state that for the first time, she learned how to open up to others. Her life had a normality that it never had when A.B. and his addiction were present. She would say, and I quote, I thank the Lord for the peace I have in my life now. I can do ordinary things like go to the shops or hang up the washing. I don't have to be scared that he'll steal something. But things, unfortunately, did not stay that peaceful for long. Early in 2012, Ellen lost her eldest grandson, O'Neill Tambor, to Tuck and gangsterism. He was killed in a gang-related shooting in April. And then once again, addiction hit close to home in the form of her eldest son, Rudolph, who was 33 years old at the time. Rudolph, who had actually been using for years, he was the one who introduced AB to methamphetamine, would start to come to Ellen's home looking for money to feed his addiction. At the time, he was unemployed and he was the father to six children. Ellen wanted to get him help, but he refused. And so for a period of time, the two had gone their separate ways. Months later, though, during the festive season, there was an inkling of hope as Ellen was determined to see a different outcome. Unfortunately, that is the most recent and current update I have on how Ellen is doing. Ellen's story of trauma, conflict, pain and suffering really hit home with so many South Africans dealing with the crisis of substance abuse in our country. So much so that a film based on the events that had transpired was made. And fun fact, it was filmed within Ellen's actual home. When the film Ellen, the story of Ellen Pakis, premiered at the Silver Scarum Festival, it won a number of awards, including Best Actress and Actor, for both individuals who played Ellen and A.B. in the movie. Jill Levenberg, the amazing actress and woman who played Ellen in the movie, would later say, and I quote, I am incredibly humbled and honored to have received this role. It is life-changing and it has given me a platform. I hope that this film will make a difference and that it will start a conversation around the country and that the desperation of people in Ellen's situations who are still living that way will be taken seriously. And after making waves locally, it did the same overseas. Regardless of being set in Lavender Hill within Cape Town, so many connected with the narrative and experiences of the characters portrayed. The story affected so many because it highlighted not only the epidemic that is substance addiction within the country, but also the psychosocial settings that enable and drive this abuse. It shows how the legacies of the past have influenced the situations of the present, where substances are a coping mechanism to escape harsh realities, where adequate service delivery and help is not available, where so many lives can be affected by the actions of just one individual. As Ellen said within one of her many talks, And once again, for the last time, I quote, 
my tears go out to the mothers and fathers here. People who are not going through it don't understand. I know I murdered my child. It's not easy for me to say that. But I hope you won't walk this path. If you or someone you love is struggling with addiction, please reach out and seek help. I've included some contact information in the episode description for organizations that might just change a life. You are not alone in this. Until next week, stay safe, stay blessed, and stay the amazing human beings that I know each and every single one of you are. Bye!